Good day, future medtechs and future doctors. For today, we will be discussing about the overview of the lymphatic system. When you say system, it means that there is the group of organs. One of the organs that belong to the lymphatic system is the lymph node. The common characteristic among the organs that belong to this particular body system is that the organs are hypercellular, meaning they contain a lot of cells, just like what you see in the picture of the lymph nodes. Before we'll discuss the different organs that belong to the lymphatic system, it's very important to be reviewed on the terms parenchyma and stroma. When you say parenchyma, these are the active cells of the organ. So in terms of the lymph node, the spleen, and other lymphoid organs, the active cells are the lymphocytes. And you know very well that T cells and B cells are lymphocytes. So therefore, they are the parenchyma of the lymphatic system. When you say stroma, these are structures that support the parenchyma. So what structures in the lymphoid organs provide support and protection to the T cells and B cells? Take a look at the picture of the lymph node and then refer to the 6 o'clock position of the photo. Please look for that structure that is labeled as capsule. The capsule is the protective covering of the lymph node. It is there to provide support and protection to the T cells and B cells. So therefore, capsule is one of the structures that belong to the stroma of the lymph node. And then please do appreciate that at some points, the capsule will invaginate into the lymph node, forming now the structures labeled as trabiculae, plural, trabicula, singular. So the second structure that belongs to the stroma of the lymph lymphoid organs is the trabicula. You have learned from histology that if an organ contains a lot of cells, the best fiber that would support these cells is reticular fiber. So that makes reticular fiber as the third structure that belongs to the stroma of the lymphoid organs. Stroma, supporting structures of the parenchyma of the organ. And the stroma includes the capsule, the trabeculae, and the reticular fibers. We will prepare a thin section of this lymph node and we will view it under the microscope. And this is how it will look like. At this point, we will try to identify the structures that belong to the stroma of the lymph node. We have here the protective covering, which is the capsule. The extension of the capsule, which is the trabicula or trabiculae. And you know very well that if the organ has a lot of cells, the best fiber that would support them is reticular fiber. The lymphatic system is composed of lymphatic vessels and lymphatic tissues or organs. We will first discuss the lymphatic vessels. You have here in this picture the red-colored arteriole and the blue-colored venule. Between these two blood vessels, you have there the thin-walled capillaries. The capillaries are so thin that every time the blood will flow through their lumen, the blood will exert pressure on their walls, causing some of the fluids to leak out, and that will somehow help in the diffusion of nutrients. But the thing is, fluids will accumulate in the tissue through time because the blood will continuously flow through the capillaries. And we cannot afford for that to happen or else the organ will swell because of the accumulation of the leaked fluids from the capillaries. That is now solved by the presence of those green-colored vessels and we will name them or refer to them as the lymphatic vessels. The fluids that have escaped out from the capillary will now be called as the lymph and what will collect the lymph are these green-colored lymphatic vessels. The functions of the lymphatic vessels is to collect the lymph that has leaked out from the capillaries. But aside from that, these lymphatic vessels can sample the antigens present on the tissue or organ. What do we mean by lymphatic vessels sampling the antigens present in the tissue or organ? Let's assume that the organ supplied by these blood vessels is currently infected. What will happen is, once the lymph is formed, 
the lymph will cause all of the microorganisms to flow through it and as soon as the lymph will be drained into the lymphatic vessels, the lymph will carry along with it the microorganisms. So the microorganisms now will flow along with the lymph inside the lymphatic vessels. And do you know what will happen to the microorganisms in the lymph? They will eventually be trapped and killed in the lymph nodes. So this picture is showing us that the microorganisms that came from the organ where the lymphatic vessels originated are now trapped, filtered, and being killed by the cells of the lymph node. And since the cells of the lymph node will proliferate in the presence of these microorganisms, the proliferation will eventually cause the lymph node to become swollen. That's why if you will encounter patients in the future with lymphadenopathy, one of the things that you should bear in mind is the possibility of infection. So, let's say you have a patient with cervical lymphadenopathy. What you need to do is to evaluate the origin of the lymphatic vessels draining into the swollen lymph nodes. So, in the case of cervical lymphadenopathy, you have to check for possibility of oral dental infections and possibility of tonsillitis and pharyngitis. So the lymphatic system now is composed of vessels, tissues, and organs that work together to circulate a colorless watery fluid and we call that as the lymph. And later on, I will make you appreciate that these organs, tissues, and vessels will also function to put back the lymph into the circulatory system. Anyways, the lymph was derived from the fluids that have escaped out from the capillaries and capillaries are part of the circulatory system. Aside from circulating the colorless watery lymph, these vessels, tissues, and organs also function to monitor body surfaces and internal body compartments to detect presence of antigens. If antigens are indeed present, then these organs and tissues will create immune responses against them. The parenchyma of the lymphatic system includes the T-cells and the B-cells. Majority of them are circulating along with the lymph, 70%, while the remaining 30% are found within the secondary lymphoid tissues. Please recall that T-cells and B-cells are produced and they mature in the primary lymphoid organs. Once they will reach maturity, they will now leave the primary lymphoid organs and stay in the secondary lymphoid organs. Again, the lymphatic system is composed of vessels and tissues or organs. At this point, we will try to identify the different tissues and organs that belong to the lymphatic system. We have number one, the spleen. We have the thymus. And we have the lymph nodes. Also included is the bone marrow because bone marrow functions to produce the T-cells and B-cells. But there's one thing I want you all to take note. What is unique about the organs and tissues that belong to the lymphatic system is that some of them are found in organs that belong to another body system. And we collectively call these tissues as mucosa-associated lymphatic tissues. So I want you to take a look at this group of lymphatic tissues here that are found in the appendix. Appendix is part of the digestive system. But there are lymphatic tissues found in the appendix. Therefore, these lymphatic tissues will now be referred to as mucosa-associated lymphatic tissues. There are two types of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, MALT. The first type of which is the bronchos-associated lymphatic tissue or BALT. These lymphatic tissues are found in the organs that belong to the respiratory system. 
So take a look at the cut section of the bronchial. Can you appreciate that below the epithelium of the bronchial, you have their group of cells uh, that is labeled as lymphoid tissue. So this group of lymphocytes here will be referred to as bronchus associated lymphatic tissue. And they are examples of mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. The second type of malt is gut, gut associated lymphatic tissue. And this type of tissues are found in the organs that belong to the digestive tract. So the lymphatic tissues that are present in the appendix belong to the gut associated lymphatic tissue. These are the examples of the mucosa associated lymphatic tissues. We have malt in our tonsils and we have three types of tonsils the lingual palatine and pharyngeal tonsils we also have malt in our ilium and we call that as the payer's patches and we also have malt in the appendix this is the palatine tonsil as you can see this is supposed to be part of the digestive system but you have their lymphatic tissues so therefore this is an example of malt, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. This is the lingual tonsil and the lingual word means tongue and tongue is part of the digestive system. These are the payer's patches of the ilium. So since the ilium is part of the gastrointestinal tract, we will refer to the payer's patches as part of the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. And these are the lymphatic tissues that we can find in the appendix. You have learned from the introduction to immunology that lymphoid organs can be classified as primary or secondary. When you say primary lymphoid organs, these are organs that serve as site of production and maturation of the parenchyma of the lymphatic system. We are talking about the T cells and B cells. T cells are produced in the bone marrow and they mature in the thymus, while the bone marrow will serve as the site of production and maturation for B cells. And once the T cells and B cells will become mature, they will immediately leave the thymus and bone marrow, and they will now go to the next set of lymphoid organs. And these are the secondary lymphoid organs. It is in these lymphoid organs where the mature T cells and B cells are stored. It is also in these lymphoid organs that they will wait for their encounter with their antigen. And once they will encounter their antigen, they will proliferate and differentiate to create immune responses against the specific antigen. So the other organs that I have mentioned will belong to the secondary lymphoid organs and what are these organs the tonsils the lymph nodes the spleen and the lymphatic tissues that belong to the malt mucosa associated lymphatic tissue at this point we will be discussing how do t and b cells circulate in the lymph let us start with this picture we have here the red colored arteriole you have there the blue colored venule and then between them is the capillary you also have there the green colored lymphatic capillary please take note lymphatic vessels or lymphatic capillaries are described to be blind ending blood vessels what do you mean by blind ending the artery is continuous with the capillary the capillary is continuous with the venule and that's a closed system take a look at the lymphatic capillary it is not connected with another vessel. That's why it's described to be blind ending. So lymphatic vessels are networks of blind ending capillaries which function to collect the lymph, the fluid that has escaped out from the capillaries. Aside from doing that, they are also known to sample the microorganisms and antigens present in the tissue or organ. The thing is, microorganisms have large sizes. Antigens, most of the time proteins, have high molecular weights. So how will these lymphatic capillaries bring these 
microorganisms and antigens into their lumen so that they would circulate along with the lymph? The answer is, these lymphatic vessels are provided with flap-like mini valves. Please take a look at the red arrow. It's showing us that lymphatic vessels terminate blindly. They are not connected with other vessels. And aside from that, the red arrow is showing us that uh, in the walls of the lymphatic vessels, you have there the presence of flap-like mini valves, which can just open and allow the lymph that is carrying the microorganisms and antigens to flow from the tissue towards the lumen of these lymphatic vessels. You know very well that the lymphatic vessel will carry the lymph and as well as the antigens and microorganisms towards the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes have two important portions. You have the concave side, you call that as the hilum, and you have there the convex side. And based on what you have learned, the lymph will enter through the convex side of the lymph node. So therefore, the lymphatic vessels that are found on the convex side of the lymph node will be named afferent lymphatic vessels. Because whenever you use the term afferent, it means it is introducing something into an organ. So the lymphatic vessels found on the convex side of the lymph node are referred to as afferent lymphatic vessels while lymph exit through the hilum. So therefore, the lymphatic vessels that you can see in there should be referred to as efferent lymphatic vessels. There are two ways on how lymphocytes can enter the lymph nodes. The first one is via the afferent lymphatic vessels found on the convex side of the lymph nodes. Some of the T-cells and B-cells that had entered the lymph node will remain in the lymph nodes. Remember, 70% of them are in the circulating pool, while 30% are found in the secondary lymphoid organs. While some of them will exit the lymph node via the efferent lymphatic vessel present on the hilum of the lymph nodes. The thing is, the lymph that will enter the afferent lymphatic vessel at the convex side of the lymph node will be carrying microorganisms. And these microorganisms now will be filtered as they flow through the lymph node. So the lymph node will make it a point that once the lymph will leave the lymph node via the efferent lymphatic vessel, that lymph node is already antigen and microbe-free. Do you know what will happen? These efferent lymphatic vessels will eventually drain into the right lymphatic trunk. And take a look at the picture. This right lymphatic trunk will eventually drain to the right subclavian vein. So the thing is, the lymph now is returned back to the circulatory system. So this is just to show you guys that the efferent lymphatic vessels will drain into the lymphatic trunk and the lymphatic trunk will drain into the subclavian vein, returning now the lymph to the circulating blood. That's why I have to show you this slide again. Because I mentioned a while ago that the lymphatic system is composed of vessels, tissues, and organs that function together to move that colorless watery fluid that we call the lymph. And aside from that, they also function to return back the lymph to the circulatory system, which we have already emphasized a while ago. The second way on how lymphocytes can enter the lymph nodes is via the high endothelial venule. But before that, I want everybody to take note that the lymph node is an organ, and organs in the body have their own blood supply. So that's why I expect that this lymph node would have its own arterial blood supply. 
And where is now that high endothelial venule? It is found on the area within the lymph node where the artery will drain towards the vein or the arteriole will drain towards the venule. This is the arteriole supplying the lymph node. This is the venule. The area where they will intersect is called the high endothelial venule. And this will serve as the point of entry of lymphocytes into the lymph nodes. What makes this high endothelial venule different from your typical blood vessel is that instead of being lined by simple squamous epithelium, the high endothelial venule has a simple cuboidal epithelium. This is a thin section of the lymph node and then take a look at the high endothelial venule. It's very obvious in the picture that it is lined by simple cuboidal epithelium. The entry of the lymphocytes into the lymph node via the high endothelial venule is called the lymphocyte homing. And this homing process involves three important steps. Homing is activated especially if the lymph node has filtered microorganisms or antigens. So the T cells and B cells specific to those microorganisms and antigens will be recruited from the blood circulation towards the lymph node. And that is made possible by the high endothelial venule. So you have here in this picture a cross section, thin section of the lymph node. Shown here are two high endothelial venues. And then I want you to take a look at the arrow that is labeled homing. It's telling you that the lymphocyte should transfer from the blood circulation towards the lymph node. The first stage in lymphocyte homing is the tethering and rolling. When you say tethering, it has something to do with attachment. For the lymphocytes to diffuse out of the blood circulation into the lymph nodes via the high endothelial venule, they must be able to attach themselves to the cuboidal cells of the high endothelial venule. What will they use? They will use L-selectin, which is very similar to the L-selectin used in chemotaxis. But this time, these L-selectins displayed by the lymphocytes will attach to the pinads the peripheral node addressins expressed by the cuboidal cells of the high endothelial venues. Examples of these peripheral node addressins are glycam-1 and CD34. You really have to memorize them. Okay? The binding of L-selectin to glycam-1 and CD34 is weak. So what will happen eventually? the L-selectin will detach from the peripheral node addressins and the lymphocyte will roll, which is similar to chemotaxis. Stage 2 would involve the expression of LFA1. What do we mean by LFA1? Leukocyte function associated protein. And this LFA1 will be used by the lymphocytes to attach themselves to the ICAM receptors present on the cuboidal cells of the high endothelial venule. The binding of the LFA1 integrin to ICAM is tight because the two have high affinity towards each other. So, tethering and rolling will be followed by firm adhesion. And you know what will happen? As the lymphocyte is firmly attached to the wall of the high endothelial venule, it will eventually flatten out. So take a look at the picture of the lymphocyte. Can you appreciate that at the middle part of the diagram, you have there the appearance of those red circles on the surface of the lymphocyte? Those are the LFA1 integrin. And as the LFA1 integrin will bind to ICAM, the lymphocyte will become flat. Stage 3 is diapedesis, the squeezing through of lymphocyte between the cuboidal cells of the high endothelial venule. And this is made possible by JAM1, junctional adhesion molecule 1. 
So the flat lymphocyte will bind to JAM1 and it will help the flat lymphocyte squeeze through between the cuboidal cells of the high endothelial venule. And the lymphocyte now is within the stroma of the lymph node. Homing is activated to concentrate the lymphocytes within the lymph node so that they can help in generating the immune response against the filtered microorganism and antigen. So how will you keep the lymphocytes within the lymph nodes without allowing them to go out through the efferent lymphatic vessels? Because if they will go out of the efferent lymphatic vessels, then homing will become useless. Now take a look at this picture. The chemical that always recruits the lymphocytes out of the lymph nodes is called the S1P. S1P stands for sphingosine 1-phosphate. So if that chemical is present, it will bind to the receptor of the lymphocytes. And what will happen? The lymphocytes will go out of the lymph nodes. During homing, the receptor to this sphingosine 1-phosphate will be down-regulated. So meaning the, lymph the lymphocytes will stop expressing them or will reduce their expression on their surfaces. So therefore, they will become less responsive to sphingosine 1-phosphate. So therefore, these lymphocytes will no longer go out of the lymph nodes via the efferent lymphatic vessel. So, scientists today are concentrating on down-regulating the receptors for sphingosine 1-phosphate, especially for those patients who had received organ transplant. Why? Because these scientists or physicians would only want the lymphocytes to stay in the lymph node so that they will not cause the rejection of the transplanted organ. There are two patterns of arrangements for lymphatic tissues in the organs where they can be found. They can be in diffuse pattern or they can be in a compact, well-circumscribed pattern that we call as the nodule. The lymphatic tissues are in diffuse pattern if the lymphocytes will accumulate with no clear boundary. And most of the time, these diffuse lymphatic tissues are found in some of the organs that belong to the gastrointestinal tract, genitourinary tract, and respiratory tract. And you can always find them below the epithelium. These finger-like projections are the villi of the small intestine. Please take a look at the simple columnar epithelium of the small intestine. And below the simple columnar epithelium of the small intestine, you have their accumulation of lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes are arranged in diffuse pattern. Take a look at the lymphocytes found below the epithelium of this bronchule. They are arranged in diffuse pattern. But if the lymphocytes are organized in compact, somehow circumscribed structure, then we will call or refer to that lymphatic tissue as a nodule or follicle. Lymphatic nodules can be classified as primary and secondary. If the nodule is dark stained because it is composed of densely packed lymphocytes, you will refer to it as primary lymphatic nodule. Most likely, the lymphocytes in the primary nodules have not yet encountered their antigens. Once they do, the central portion of that nodule will become light stained and it will now become the secondary lymphatic nodule or secondary lymphatic follicles. Take a look at the nodule pointed by the blue arrow. It's dark stained and this is an example of a primary lymphatic nodule. This is another picture of a primary lymphatic nodule. The nodules shown in this picture are both primary type. But if the nodule has a light staining center surrounded by a dark staining periphery, then you will refer to that nodule as a secondary lymphoid nodule or secondary lymphatic nodule. The light staining area within the secondary nodule is called the germinal center. 
majority of the cells that we can find in the germinal center are B cells. And these B cells are activated once. And they are the ones that will form the memory cells and the plasma cells. And since the plasma cells would use their DNA so that they can produce antibodies, their DNA will be loosely attached to their histones, making their nuclei appear lighter. That's why the central portion of the germinal center is lighter in staining compared to the peripheral portion. Now, the dark staining peripheral portion is referred to as mantle zone or corona. This is a good picture of a secondary lymphatic nodule. Please appreciate the light staining germinal center and the dark staining corona or mantle zone. The lymphatic nodules labeled as number 2, 3, and 4 are all secondary type of nodules. If the diffuse pattern of lymphatic tissues are found in the organs that belong to the gastrointestinal tract, genitourinary tract, and respiratory tract, and they are found below the epithelium, where can we find lymphatic nodules? They can be found in the tonsils, the Peyer's patches of the ileum, and in the appendix. You have learned a while ago that there are three types of tonsils. You have palatine, you have lingual, and you have pharyngeal tonsils. This is the cut section of the pharyngeal tonsil. Please appreciate that you have their lymphatic nodules, particularly secondary type. Lymphatic nodules can also be found in the Peyer's patches of the ileum. Let me first help you how to identify ileum under the microscope. Ilium is one of the segments of the small intestine. Small intestine is known to have finger-like projections on its lumen, and these finger-like projections are called villi. So expect to find villi on the lumen of the ilium. And then, the villi is always accompanied by a short invagination, and we call that short invagination as the crypt of Libercan. This is a cross-section of the ilium. This is one of its villi. This is one of its crypt of Libercon. This is another villus. And this is another crypt of Libercon. So that will tell you that you're looking at one of the segments of the small intestine. And then take a look at the layer below the villi and crypts of Libercon. Can you appreciate lymphatic nodules? Those are now the payers' patches. This is another picture of the ilium. Please appreciate the presence of villi and crypts of Libercon and take a look at the arrangement of the lymphocytes in the payer's patches. They are in nodular pattern. Lymphatic nodules can also be found in the appendix. Appendix is part of the large intestine and large intestine does not have villi. In contrast to small intestine, the crypts of Libercon of the large intestine are quite longer. This is how the appendix would look like under the microscope. Please appreciate the absence of villi and appreciate the long crypts of Libercon. Can you appreciate that there are lymphatic nodules within the appendix? This is another picture of the cross section of the appendix. This is one of the long crypts of Libercon. And then, take a look at the area below the pointed crypt of Libercon. Can you appreciate a lymphatic nodule? Let us now try to discuss the microscopic features of the different major organs of the lymphatic system. Let's start with the bean-shaped lymph node. You have learned a while ago that it has two surfaces. You have the concave, which contains the hilum, and the convex, which has the afferent lymphatic vessels. Lymph nodes are secondary lymphoid organs, so expect that it will act as a storage of mature T-cells and B-cells. It will also serve as the site where the T-cells and B-cells will encounter their specific antigens. And as you have learned from the introduction to this chapter, the lymph nodes can also filter microorganisms and antigens 
in the lymph introduced via its afferent lymphatic vessel. Lymph nodes are small encapsulated kidney bean shaped organ and it has two types of lymphatic vessels. You have the afferent lymphatic vessels present on its convex surface and efferent lymphatic vessels present on its hilum or concave surface. Just like the other organs of the lymphatic system, the lymph nodes have parenchyma and stroma. The parenchyma would always involve the functional cells. We have the T cells and B cells. And for the T cell to be activated, for it to activate B cell, you must also have the presence of antigen presenting cells in the form of dendritic cells or macrophages. The stroma of the lymph node includes the capsule, trabecula, and reticular fibers. Let's have a review. This is the capsule of the lymph node. The invagination of the capsule will form the trabecula or trabeculae. And then, the cells within the lymph nodes are supported by the reticular fibers. Lymph nodes have two important regions, the cortex and the medulla. The outer dark staining region of the lymph node is called the cortex. I intentionally put the red arrow on the cortical region of the lymph node. Blue arrow is pointing to the capsule. White arrow is pointing to one of the trabeculae. And the red arrow is positioned on the cortex region of the lymph node. The cortex can easily be identified because it is the outer layer and it is dark staining. The cortex of the lymph node is further divided into superficial and deep. Please refer to the blue arrow. The blue arrow is situated on the superficial cortex of the lymph node. That particular area in the lymph node primarily contains B cells, and the B cells are arranged in lymphatic nodular pattern. Take a look at the picture of this lymph node. Immediately below the capsule, you have the superficial cortex. Please appreciate that the cells in there are arranged in nodular pattern and majority of the cells in the superficial cortex are B cells. Red arrow is showing us the cortex region of the lymph node while blue arrow is showing us the superficial cortex. The other portion of the cortex of the lymph node is called the deep cortex or paracortex. Please refer to the brown arrow. And in this particular area of the cortex of the lymph node, the cells are arranged in diffuse pattern. Superficial cortex, nodular, deep cortex, diffuse. Majority of the cells in the superficial cortex are B cells. In the case of deep cortex, majority of the cells are T cells. Red arrow is showing us the whole cortical region of the lymph node. Blue arrow is showing us the superficial cortex. Take note of the nodular patterns of the cells in there. Majority of the cells in the superficial cortex are B cells. Brown arrow is showing us the deep or paracortex, wherein the cells are in diffuse pattern and majority of them are T cells. The inner region of the lymph node is called the medulla. Compared to the cortex, medulla is light staining. And the tissues here are arranged in medullary cords separated by medullary sinuses. I will explain this one later on. Red arrow is showing us the whole cortical region of the lymph node. Green arrow is showing us the light staining medullary region. This is the superficial cortex. This is the deep cortex. The cells in the medulla are arranged in medullary cords. When you say medullary cords, the cells are arranged in a tube-like pattern. These medullary cords are separated by spaces, and these spaces will be referred to as the medullary sinuses. 
B cells predominate in the superficial cortex. The deep cortex has abundant T cells. The cell that will predominate in the medullary region of the lymph node is the macrophage. What do we know about macrophages? They are phagocytes and they can act as antigen presenting cells. So if you have them in the medullary cords, then expect that the microorganisms and antigens brought by the lymph into the afferent lymphatic vessel then into the lymph node will be captured in the medullary region because you have there the phagocytes, the macrophages. Bacteria will be carried by the lymph and will enter the lymph node via the afferent lymphatic vessels. The afferent lymphatic vessels will drain on the spaces below the capsule and we call them as the subcapsular sinuses. Then, lymph will flow through the trabecular sinuses, the sinuses that we can find along the trabeculae of the lymph nodes. But, I want you all to think that the cells that we can find on the superficial cortex are B cells and they are not phagocytes. So therefore, from the subcapsular sinus down to the trabecular sinus, the microorganisms will not yet be attacked by the cells. Along the trabecular sinuses, the microorganism will go down the deep cortex and you have their T-cells. And T-cells cannot also recognize these microorganisms and antigens. It is only when the microorganisms and antigens will reach the medulla, that's the time that they will be captured and phagocytosed by the macrophages there. So, understanding the flow of lymph into the lymph node, you will really appreciate that the lymph will go out of the efferent lymphatic vessels microbe-free or antigen-free. Now, what is the reason behind the arrangement of the cells in the lymph nodes? Why do we have B cells on the superficial cortex, T cells on the deep cortex, and macrophages in the medullary cords? Let's have a review of what you have learned in the introduction to immunology. Microorganisms will be engulfed by APCs, antigen-presenting cells such as macrophages, and these macrophages will present the antigen to T helper cells. And once activated, the T helper cells will activate B cells to become plasma cells. And the plasma cells will produce antibodies. That is basically the reason behind the arrangements of the cells in the lymph node. The macrophages are found in the medulla because that is where filtration of the lymph happens. So most likely, the microorganisms and the antigens will be captured by the macrophages there. Macrophages act as antigen-presenting cells, and they present the antigens to T-cells. So might as well place the T-cells beside these macrophages. And the best location is the deep cortex or paracortex. And once activated, these T-helper cells are supposed to activate B-cells. So might as well place B-cells beside the T-cells. So that's why... The cells that will dominate on the superficial cortex is the B cell. You have learned a while ago that lymphocytes can enter the lymph nodes via two means. Number one, via the afferent lymphatic vessels present on the convex side of the lymph nodes. And number two, via the high endothelial venues. And since at this point, you, you can already identify the regions of the lymph nodes, it's now time to identify the location of the high endothelial venues. They are particularly found at the deep cortex of the lymph nodes, as shown in the picture. These are two high endothelial venues, so expect that the majority of the cells around them are T-cells because they are found in the deep cortex of the lymph node which is primarily composed of what cell again t cell the next organ that we will discuss is the spleen this is the largest among the lymphatic organs and it is situated on the upper left quadrant of the abdomen the spleen functions to number one filter the lymph and this is carried out by its white pulp and 
spleen is known to be the graveyard of old red blood cells because one of its function is to destroy old and damaged red blood cells and this is carried out by its red pulp. This is a fresh cut section of a spleen. The red colored areas are the red pulps and that is where the old and damaged red blood cells are destroyed. The white circular areas are the white pulps and that is where the lymph is filtered. This is how the spleen will look like under the microscope. Appreciate that the white pulps appear as lymphatic nodules and these white pulps are surrounded by the red pulps. For you to easily identify that this is the spleen and not the lymph node, please check the distribution of the lymphatic nodules. In the lymph node, the nodules are found at the superficial cortex, while in the spleen, the lymphatic nodules are scattered all throughout the organ. Just like the lymph nodes, spleen also has parenchyma and stroma. In terms of parenchyma, you have the T-cells and the B-cells plus the macrophages. And in terms of stroma, the same structures. You have the capsule, trabeculae, and the reticular fibers. What if you will be asked to identify this particular lymphatic nodule? This one is viewed under oil immersion objective. Therefore, you cannot identify the location of this lymphatic nodule. Because if this nodule is viewed under scanner or low power, you can still identify whether the nodule is distributed all throughout the organ, then that organ is identified as the spleen. But if the nodule is found on the superficial area, then that organ is identified as lymph node. But take a look at this lymphatic nodule. You don't have any means of identifying whether it is located on the superficial area or distributed all throughout the organ. I want you to take a look at the artery in the center of the lymphatic nodule. That is a central artery. And the presence of such would identify that the lymphatic nodule you're looking at is a white pulp and the organ is the spleen. Take a look at this lymphatic nodule. Can you appreciate that it has a central artery? So that's a giveaway clue. You're looking at one of the white pulps of the spleen. The lymphocytes encircling the central artery are referred to as the periarterial lymphatic sheath. So the white pulps of the spleen have two parts. You have the central artery and you have the periarterial lymphatic sheath. This yellow arrow is pointing to the red pulp. You have there abundance of red blood cells. In the red pulp of the spleen, you have there red arrow, splenic cords, which are basically composed of macrophages. And these macrophages are just waiting for any red blood cell that will be trapped along with the green arrow, sinuses. These sinuses are too small that the red blood cells have to deform themselves in order for them to squeeze through the sinuses and go out of the spleen. Old red blood cells are no longer deformable, same as with damaged red blood cells. So what will happen? If these red blood cells will flow through green arrow, splenic sinuses, they will be most likely trapped and the macrophages in the red arrow, splenic cords, will engulf them and destroy them. By the way, the other name for the splenic cords of the spleen is Billroth cord. This is another picture of the red pulp. The arrows 1, 2, and 3 are all pointing to the splenic sinuses where the red blood cells are supposed to flow through to go out of the spleen. And these splenic sinuses are separated by the Billroth cords or the splenic cords. The last but not the least, the thymus. This is a bilobed organ found at the mediastinum of the thoracic cavity. And this organ primarily serves as the site for maturation of T-cells. The thoracic cavity is composed of smaller cavities. You have the pericardial cavity which houses the heart, the pleural cavity which houses the lungs, and the yellow colored mediastinum. And that is where we can find our thymus. 
In terms of the stroma, you have learned a while ago that in the lymph nodes, you have there the protective covering in the form of capsule. Once the capsule will invaginate the lymph node, it will form the trabeculae. In the case of thymus, instead of forming trabeculae, the capsule will give rise to septum. What is now the difference between a trabecula and a septum? Remember, in the lymph node, the capsule will form small invaginations and these small invaginations will be referred to as trabeculae. In the case of thymus, you have there the capsule and once the capsule will invaginate the thymus, it will actually divide the organ into lobules. As you can see, you have here one lobule and this lobule is separated from this lobule and this lobule is also separated from this lobule. So, the part where the capsule will invaginate the thymus, you will not call it as trabecula. You will call it as a septum because a septum is supposed to separate things into compartments. This is one thymus and appreciate the individual lobules that were formed by the septum that came from the capsule. So, the stroma of the thymus should include the capsule the septum, and the reticular fibers. I want you to focus on one of the lobules. Can you appreciate that each of the lobule has a dark staining outer cortex and a light staining inner medulla? So, the lobules of the thymus would appear like that of the lymph nodes. So, how will you identify which is which? This is a cut section of one of the thymic lobules. Take a look at the dark staining outer region. That's the cortex. The cortex of the lymph nodes also appear to be dark stained. So how will you differentiate the two? Remember, in the superficial cortex, you have nodules in there. While in the cortex of the thymic lobule, the lymphocytes are all arranged in diffused pattern. Take a look at the light staining inner medulla. One of the histological features of the thymic medulla is that it has the presence of the Hassel's corpuscles. But I will not ask that in the exam. That is so histology. Let's just focus with what you need to learn for immunology. If you will be asked, what lymphocytes can you find in the lymph node, you answer, B cells in the superficial cortex, T cells in the deep cortex. But if you will be asked what lymphocyte can you find in the thymus, you should answer T cells only because it is only the T cells that will go to the thymus and mature there. Please take note that after we reach the age of puberty, our thymus will reduce in size because it will undergo involution. And most scientists are suggesting that what is causing the thymus to atrophy is the reproductive hormones such as estrogen and testosterone. Majority of the areas in the thymus will be replaced by adipose tissue. So let's try to compare the thymus of a child, left photo, and thymus of the adult, right photo. Can you appreciate that on the thymus of adults you have there, adipose cells replacing majority of the parenchyma of the thymus. This is Dr. Francis Ian Salaver and I would like to thank you for spending time to listening to my lecture on overview of the lymphatic system. Thank you.